So we're going to start with just quick introductions. <coughs> and we also want to know who's just in the audience, so we're going to do a quick, we're not going to make everybody introduce individually, but we want to know how many of you are classroom teachers, K-12 classroom teachers? All right, how many of you are administrators, K-12 administrators? Okay, how many of you, uh, school administrators? District administrators? <coughs> State administrators? Okay, how many of you provide professional learning? Okay, whoa! <laughs> All right, awesome. <laughs> so who do we leave out? Higher Anybody? Ed? Anyone higher ed? Higher ed. Higher ed and professional learning. Okay, got it. All right, I know what you guys do. I, I know both of you. <laughs> okay, so um, my name's Liz Berquist, and I um, work in Baltimore County Schools, which is funny for me to say, because I just went back there in September. Um, I actually started my career in Baltimore County, and then I went to higher education for about eight years. So I just came back to Baltimore County, and my major role is doing professional development in the district. So teacher leaders, um, school administrators, um, our professional development teachers, who we refer to as stat teachers. Stephanie will talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and then I also um, continue to do a lot of work with CAST. I was on their original cadre um, that started out years ago and um, have been really fortunate to work with uh, people at CAST and have had a lot of great training from them and mentorship from those folks. So um, that's a little bit about me. It's my wonderful colleague. And I'm Stephanie Pouts. I'm the coordinator of curriculum operations in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, and in that role, I work with our 10 secondary lighthouse schools. And you'll learn what that means in just a moment. So I lead the professional learning for the principals, um, work with Liz on professional learning for the teacher leaders, with the PLCs that are in each building. Um, and then I also, I, I get to see the, the whole process with curriculum development. Um, so I work with all of our academic offices to make sure that the curriculum is aligned with the direction that we're going and what does that look like in our learning management system so I also um, I'm the functional manager for the LMS so I do a few things <laughs> so we're gonna start off the session um, by telling you a little bit about Baltimore County Public Schools and what's happening in our district because we are in uh, year four of a systemic change in instruction um, so we are a um, we're a minority my, my, majority minority school system um, and I say that because to give you some context our county so Maryland all of the school systems are by county our county has seen some real demographic changes over the past 10 years we used to be um, a majority white population rural suburban and then over the past 10 years we've really seen a shift in our demographic and we've become much more urban suburban as that happened, we started to see um, real equity issues emerge. So when we, um, our new superintendent as of 2013, Dr. Dance, when he came to our school system, he saw that. And we rewrote our master plan to specifically address those issues of equity that we were seeing in our schools. And as part of that, um, we've developed a new theory of action. And it's, a, it's what we like to call a bold theory of action because we've said that in order to equip every student with the critical 21st century skills that they need to be globally competitive, so we don't talk as much about being college and career ready, we talk about being globally competitive, BCPS has to ensure that every school has an equitable, effective digital learning environment and every student has access, equitable access to learning and developing proficiency in a second language. So we're going to focus on the first part of the theory of action today. We're not going to talk about our um, second language initiative. We're going to talk about our digital learning environment. And all of this within the schedule are linked. So if you're interested in learning more, anything that's underlined will take you either to our primary document. So if you'd like to see our master plan, uh, um, Blueprint 2.0, it's there. And there's a resource here that talks about our move to digital learner-centered environments that we call STAT. So Liz mentioned that we call our professional development coaches STAT teachers. This is where that name comes from. And STAT stands for Students and Teachers Accessing Tomorrow. We actually um, asked our students to name this initiative. We wanted to give it a name. We wanted to give it a voice. And when the students named, said, they came up with this idea of STAT, we said, yeah, it's kind of medical, isn't it? <laughs> and they said, oh, yeah, but we need it STAT. We need it right now. This can't wait. So our students had real ownership in the development of this initiative. 
We also, as part of how we um, approached this transformation in teaching and learning, developed our teaching and learning framework. And the, the main image is there, but again, if you click that link, this uh, image is backed by a lot of research. So we have in the center, rigorous, relevant, responsive, accessible. That's how we define effective first instruction. And then we layered into that, you know, if that's what effective first instruction looks like, what are the skills that a globally competitive teacher needs to have? And we pulled in then the Danielson framework. That's our evaluation model. So that's where we have uh, in the lighter blue there, um, planning and preparation, classroom environment, professionalism and instruction. And then what does the globally competitive student look like? And that's that outer orange, um, learning and innovation skills, media information and technology skills, life and career skills, and core knowledge, all of which comes from the P21 framework. We also knew that if we were going to move a system with 112,000 students, over 9,000 teachers, that we had to have a very strong strategic planning framework. So we created our eight conversions because we learned very quickly that everything had to move together in the same direction at the same time. Because of what we started to see is as we were making changes in the way that we developed curriculum, we were suddenly in conflict with our own policies. So as we made the move to digital, we really had to make sure that everything was moving um, in the same direction at the same time. So that's a little bit about what's happening in Baltimore County. Um, and I'll also say, because you're probably wondering, where is the UDL framework in this? So I was in a session yesterday and the presenter talked about how um, he had done some research in a county where everyone at the upper levels of leadership were talking about UDL and were framing everything in UDL. But at the teacher level, they just didn't have that facility and language yet. And that's where we are in Baltimore County. So Liz and I every day are using the UDL framework to guide all of our planning and begin to infuse that and helping teachers begin to see those connections. So when we go into the resources in the next part of the activity, you'll see that we have some of our tools that we've created ourselves. You'll see the term learner-centered environments a lot. Um, anything to add to that, Liz? Yeah, so the, um, in a couple weeks, we hope. Um, there's going to be a book coming out from CAST, UDL, Moving from Exploration to Implementation. And in the book, um, there's a chapter on Baltimore County Schools and UDL. And that chapter was written by um, my boss, who's the Chief of Organizational Development. And he's really responsible for, um, well, lots of things. But one of them <laughs> is part of this theory of action, and especially the professional learning piece. And he sits on the superintendent's cabinet. Um, so he's like the top tier of leadership in the district. And it's all about how the UDL framework is present in the district. But our language is, um, our language, the district uses these eight conversions. They use the UDL guidelines as a lens to guide them, but you don't see UDL in the district language. Um, so that's something that Skip referenced yesterday when Stephanie was in that session. Um, but it is different, you know, because sometimes when you're working with a big district, they want to make it their own. And it's really hard to say, well, we're subscribing to this framework because it's based out of the need of your district. Um, but that doesn't mean that the people that are driving the bus are not very cognizant of what that framework is all about. So if you're interested in that, that might be something you want to check out. Any questions on that? Okay, and just as an aside, we do, um, at the teacher level, we run multiple uh, continuing professional development courses in universal design. Um, we also have um, numerous cohorts with universities where part of the um, trajectory of the teachers to get their master's or master's equivalency include courses on UDL. So we do have lots of teachers that are speaking that language, um, but you know, in a school district that, that, that is that big, you might sit next to someone on a plane who knows exactly what UDL is because they've been in a UDL PLC and they can speak the language of the checkpoints all the way down to that nitty gritty. Or you might sit next to someone that says, UDL? <laughs> We always talk about a learner-centered environment. <laughs> You're like, oh, well, it's the same thing. <laughs> so you know, that language discussion is, is something that's important if you're planning um, to, to move towards this. Um, I firmly believe that having a common language is really important. And in our areas where we've had a PLC, the ones that have worked the best are ones that do use that common language. Um, and that's my own personal anecdotal evidence doing this work and implementation across the US for the past few years. Um, so, and we are working towards more of that common language, especially with our high schools. 
All okay, right. so to move into our activity portion, we're going to take you through each one of the um, phases in the change model. So we have explore, prepare, integrate, and scale. So how do you take teachers who are at each one of those levels and move them? As this, these, this language, if you're familiar with CAS UDL implementation work, this is where this came from. And we use this model when we design professional learning for our teachers. So what we're going to do with you is something that as professional develop, de developers in our district, we do with our leadership in our Lighthouse schools. So we actually just did this activity with our building level principals. So with each one of the phases, we're going to ask, what is important to remember about this phase? Who in our school or district is in this phase? And then how will I support them in their change process? So Liz, are you going to yeah, model yeah, for us with Explore and I'll drive? Explore. Yep, sure, okay. So if you are, are traveling with us, if you're someone that likes to kind of click and look at the same time, you want to click on this link for Explore. If you are someone who just likes to listen and kind of take it all in, you do not have to click. Feel free to just kind of sit and, and listen. Um, so on this slide right here, we have on the, the grayed out boxes on the left hand side, the overarching goal of the explore phase. Okay, so when you're exploring this concept of universal design, how to build a learner centered environment, the first thing we need to do is just get people thinking about it and raise awareness. Like, is this something that we need to do? And um, what we've learned, and the literature tells us this too, is that you're not going to get people to change unless they feel dissatisfied with something. I'm sure all the hands that went up who do PD, you know when you go in and you say, we're doing this, nobody's going to follow you. But if you go in and you ask people to think about their practice and take some time to reflect, that's a totally different game. Right, um, and we talk about like creating this um, event where you actually have to ponder what you believe about teaching and learning before you move through these stages of change. So that's really what this explore phase is about. And by the end of exploring, like if we're going in and we're working with a school, we know that we've moved out of this phase when teachers can tell us why they need to start designing learner-centered environments. So why what they have been doing hasn't been working, and they can articulate what a learner-centered environment is and why they need to shift to that. So a lot of this is about identifying barriers in this explore phase. And um, we talked yesterday about some PLC work we're doing in Texas and we said, if you look at those CAS phases and the middle one is integrate, if you just go right into integrate without giving people time to explore and prepare, you're never gonna get them to actually make any change. So that's what this initial stage is really all about. It's identifying what are your barriers and is there something that's, that's better out there to think about. And then in the orange box, we have some strategies. So things that you could do just to get people thinking about this. So I want you all just to take a second right now and think about um, what is important, and you have that graphic organizer, what's important to know about this phase? So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to talk to the people next to you. Yeah, what's important to know about this exploration phase? And if you want to dig a little deeper, you can click on it. Look at it. All right, anybody want to throw out there an idea? What do you think is the most important thing to remember 
about this phase, why it's important to those of us designing district level PD, those of us delivering professional development. Anybody? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially like if you're at second level, if you're in high right. school, you're pretty much isolated. Right. Yeah, universal design for learning is a conceptual change. Yeah. It is a mindset shift. It is not something in a box. It is not something that you sell. It is something that you believe about teaching and learning. And people aren't going to change and try a new framework unless they become dissatisfied with what they're doing. And you need to give people time to talk about that. Adults want, we know adult learning, right? We all do PD. Adults want agency in their learning. They want to be part of it. They don't want people telling them what to do. They want time. Mm -hmm. So what I see simply is that um, their learning is personal. And you're giving them an opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have more buy-in to that than if you were to tell them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's about that ownership to learning that's important here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a really good book on that, too. I know where you can get it. UDL, personalized learning. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always supporting it. Go ahead. Great point. Yeah, I love that. Starting with the why is so important. And when you move through, you see, like, this is the why. And then the next, the prepare phase is like, well, what the heck is UDL? What the heck is a learner-centered environment? And then you move into, like, how you actually do it. So, great point. Yes, so Kathleen. A really good suggestion is, um, about the why is that they should be able to articulate um, in 60 seconds or less on why they want to do it. Like, they need to know. They need to know. They need to know. They need to Mm -hmm. Right, right. Awesome. Yeah, and if you can't, that's where you run into those barriers right away. If the teacher comes to a PD and they leave saying, I don't know why I was there, we're, we're in big trouble for moving forward. Um, so up here, what we have are some things that we just kind of pulled together. Um, this is from some of our work in Baltimore County, and it's also based on the work we did um, with the Gates UDL implementation grant through CAST a couple years ago. So there's some um, discussion, guided discussion questions, and then some strategies. And under those additional strategies, in each one of these sections, these strategy, this list of strategies grew as the principals contributed things. So this was sort of a living document when we used this in PD with them because they were generating some strategies um, just as you just did. 
And then down below, if there's any pieces that you're interested in learning more about, we've linked some um, just, just resources for getting people to explore UDL and learner-centered environments. So if you were using this and going back and wanting to learn more, you would kind of go through and, and click on these and give people some time um, to, to check it out. Um, you wanna, oh yeah, it's all, it's all on there as you scroll down on the... Um, these are the tiny URLs. So click, so if you, op you have this open, so click, tap on that link and it'll take you to the page. Yep. So do you want to show the, actually let's give folks the time to chat. So we're going to, um, we're going to give you some time right now. I want you to meet somebody new in the room and those two lower boxes. So think about your district or a group you provide B uh, PD to and think about who's just kind of dipping their toe into exploration. And then you can look at the strategy list and come up with one or two ideas for how you might support people just to have this conversation. And maybe you want to go click on one of these links and look at it, and that's fine. Okay, so we're going to give you like four minutes. Talk to somebody else. Who is just in this exploration phase, and how are you going to move them through here? And we'll come back together in about four minutes. All right, we're going to bring it back in. Okay, so first of all, I know we have one person watching us on the live stream. Um, so everyone wave to Dr. Fran Smith in the camera back there. She's watching us from Virginia. <laughs> I just got a text from her. Um, okay, so we are going to give you some time to dig into the next two phases, but I just want to give anyone who's willing just share a little bit about um, the process of talking about this change using these phases. Like just thinking about like who's here, what do they need, um, is that, does that process like work for you? Do you think it's something that you could take back and think about it in that way? Or are you still kind of trying to figure it out? Anybody want to just share their experience of talking about um, moving towards more UDL implementation but thinking about it more systemically? Um, with this like implementation science behind it because a lot of times we just say hey we're gonna do UDL and then we don't think about change research we don't think about implementation science and this is all grounded in work on implementation science if you look at um, Fixin's synthesis of the literature that's a lot of this came from that so anybody want to just throw out there their discussion And so if, if the teachers can even bring that out in their discussions about what the culture is, you know, many times they've had so many initiatives that lasted a year or two, they were mm -hmm. supposed to change everything about their teaching, and then they all went away. So a lot of times I hear that, mm -hmm. you know, this is not going to be here to stay. And, and so to bring that up and talk about how that feels when things aren't here to stay, and what that does to your teaching and your comfort and all of that, can really help a lot with, you know, kind of clearing the path or at least Mm -hmm. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Uh huh? I think these two have helped me. Uh, I'm, a I'm a district leadership, so I have. Oh, sorry, hold on. Because the Fran can't hear you when oh, I'm sorry. on the stream. Well, I'm in district leadership, and these two help me to think that my plan has to be differentiated for school based leadership and differentiate it for mm -hmm. teachers in right. my approach from my vanishing point. Mm -hmm. Because I was almost about to wash my hands of one group, but they helped me I, to understand because it's been so much pushback, right. but you can't. But I have to find a way to help them grab a compelling why. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna have to rethink some things. Yep. Yep. So that was helpful. And as you're planning, we recognize that there are people in all of these different phases of implementation in one given building, in one given district. So we just can't plan for integration for everybody. We've got to realize some people are still exploring, some people are still preparing. Here's what you do when you have some people integrating. And then, like we're at the point now with our Lighthouse schools where we want to have, help them scale it to other high schools who haven't been involved in this professional learning work. So they need to figure out ways to scale
scale and bring other colleagues on board. And it occurred to me that I did not define what a lighthouse school is in my little introduction. They were our pilot schools. They went first. So part of this was a one-to-one -one initiative as well. Uh, so we started at our youngest grades. So we had 10 elementary lighthouse schools that started in grades one, two, and three. And then over the past few years, we've sort of, we've rolled that up in the grade levels. So where now we have all of our 110 elementary schools are all one-to-one -one and doing this work. And our, we have seven middle schools that are lighthouses and they have grades six and seven. All of our grade six and all of our remaining uh, middle schools. And we have three uh, high schools that are lighthouses and they are nine to 12. So what we're going to do now is we're going to give you time to think about the preparation phase and the integration phase in smaller groups at the context, or excuse me, at, um, at the level, like district level. And then you're going to apply your own kind of context to it as well. So we're going to do, let's see, can you three, just to make our groups even, slide over to this side. And we're going to go out of order, like you're going to talk about preparation first and then integration. We're going to talk about integration and then preparation. but. Um, you know, we, they're phases, so you're not stuck in one. You can move back and forth. <laughs> but that's how we're going to do it, just for the sake of getting some small group going on in and here. And we're going to ask you to circle up, so we might need to at least, like, spin some chairs around so that we're kind of having small group conversations and no one's left out. So we're going to bring everyone back together just to kind of close up as a group. I think we've had wonderful, rich discussions in both groups. We didn't get to scale. Um, but all, you can do it on your own. All of the resources are there. It's set up and structured in exactly the same way um, where you have, you have the summary, you have um, the questions to guide discussions with teachers, you have strategies. Um, and with scale, we talked about not only um, scaling within the school, so how do you move from maybe a teacher leader cohort or um, a PLC to all of the teachers in your building, and we also talked about strategies to support school to school scale. So as you move beyond like a lighthouse or a pilot, how do you then onboard and bring in all of those others, as well as all of those linked resources? One of the neat scale things that um, hopefully we'll be able to share soon, we're working on a course called um, Responsive Instruction to Support Learner Variability. Sounds familiar. Um, but that course is for teachers who are not in our lighthouse schools so that they can learn about the, the planning that goes on behind the scenes in order to make this happen. It starts with learner variability and then it goes into long range lesson planning. We talk a lot about formative assessment and then targeted small group instruction. And um, that course has a lot of video that we've built within our district. And it's going to be a, a fully online course. Um, and that it's really designed, you can do it all online, but it's designed to be blended. All the materials are online, but there's face-to-face -face sessions built in for people to kind of meet and reflect. But we're going to put that out there for people to see as a scaling mechanism for our district. So that hopefully will be up um, by this summer at some point. Yeah, so we're excited about that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We're always looking for feedback. <laughs> For sure, and we also Are do. Ex can actually use that course? Um, it's going to be just an open link right now, so um, like we're going to. If you're inside to teach it, it'll live inside of our LMS. If you want to like get interactive with it, so you would have to figure out like how to use pieces of it on your own. But it's not going to be like protected by anything. It's going to be like we do a lot of sharing and telling and selling our story, so it'll be on our PD website. <laughs> And yeah. that's because you know, in this journey, we learned so much from all of the districts that, that came before us and that started this work before us. And we did lots of visits to districts and talked with lots of administrators about their approach to this work. And that's what we really want to keep going. That's why mm -hmm. we share all of these resources. Like we said, this is, we had to pull it out of Microsoft 365 because we couldn't figure out how to share that openly without, without right. a password for BCPS. Yeah. So we moved it all into this Evernote so that you guys have this as a resource. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to share, we want to help other districts. Yeah. We also, we do external visits. So if anyone wants to come see yep. us and, and they're see free. what's happening You don't have to pay for them. Yeah, like free. if that's one thing that I learned from um, working with Cast and from, from Dr. Rose and Grace Mayo before him, is that we are never gonna make this happen if we don't all share and collaborate with each other. And our goal is to make things better for all kids. Yeah. So if we're not sharing, then we are missing so many opportunities. Um, so yeah, we're all about, all about the sharing and the collaborating. Well, I think we're out of, we're, yes, we're officially out of time. So thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you.